heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. Caroline Hyde of Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, shipping merchants, they halt Red Sea trips after the US and UK strike Houthi targets, adding to disruption in the region. Already it's impacting Tesla, for example. We break down what it all means for the global supply chain, for technology and what is being used to navigate around it. And Tesla is one of the names hit by that in the Red Sea attacks. It shut down its German plant amid the disruption. We will have all of those details. Plus, later this hour, we sit down with renowned venture capitalists, Vinod Kosler, Keith Raboy, for an exclusive conversation amid the announcement that Keith is returning to Kosler Ventures. All that and so much more coming up. First, we check in on these markets, Ed. And there's the geopolitical headwinds, those concerns about the strikes and what that means, the implications of the Middle East. And we see that hit oil in particular up one and a quarter percent if you're looking at Brent. And it takes perhaps a little of the moon music, some of the anxiety being filtered into the market. We're seeing the Nasdaq off by two tenths percent. Now, interestingly, read into that the PPI number, the macro data, the fact that inflationary pressures look to be dialing down when it comes to the producer prices, at least a surprise to the market. And it really impacts the bond market, the two year yield actually crashing to the lower that we've seen all the way back to May, many feeling that perhaps the rate cuts are back on the table, maybe at least for May. Let's move on and see what's happened in the world of Bitcoin, though, because is this a sensitivity that we're seeing to PPI, the fact that some see Bitcoin as an inflation hedge? Well, if inflationary pressures are dialing back, do we sell that news? Or also, are we selling the run-up into crypto more broadly after the spot Bitcoin ETFs come alive. Sell the news is what we tend to call it, but we're off by 1.4%, but quite that nosedive that we've seen in the last few minutes of trading, Ed. Yeah, we're going to dig deeper into that later in the program. It's really difficult to draw sort of a causal link between any of the data and specifically what's happening, although the economic data does seem to be a more significant factor than anything else. And that extends to crypto-related stocks, everyone from the trading platforms that hope to benefit from the availability of spot Bitcoin ETF through to the miners. We continue to see downward pressure. These are names, Marathon, Riot, Coinbase. They were under pressure 24 hours ago as well. But on a two-day basis, they're actually not nearing the same declines we saw immediately after the new year, which is interesting because we were all kind of waiting and seeing. We have a great segment coming up later in the program. The next stock is an interesting one, which is Tesla. There is a lot of Tesla news out there. We will cover all of it in the program. The first piece being that they have cut prices again on models in China. We will bring you those details. But the bigger news probably was the halt to production in Berlin because of supply chain impact from the Red Sea situation. Uh, how does that look? We will go to our global cars editor in the next block. But Tesla is down significantly. Volvo, the European car maker, also following with similar news, halting European production because of the impact of what's happening in the Red Sea. We've got a brilliant name coming to us now, Ryan Peterson, the CEO of Flexport, a leader in global supply chain technology. And Ryan, you've been coming on with us in recent weeks because you're keeping a micro track of the impact of what's playing out in the Red Sea. The latest from Flexport's perspective, please. Well, it, you know, the, the biggest thing here is obviously the impact on for customers, for companies shipping cargoes, the impact on price. Um, transit time as well. You mentioned Tesla um, having issues getting parts to manufacture goods. Um, I think you're going to see that across a huge swath of companies, especially in Europe, but also in the East Coast. So there's delays. And then two is the price. The price of ocean freight has gone from... Well, it's gone up about 4x, and not just from Asia to Europe, even from Asia to the U.S. on the West Coast, where you would think it's not, you know, from China to the West Coast of the United States shouldn't be impacted by the Suez on the surface, and yet it is. Prices have gone up about 3x, and, and this is partially because ships have been pulled off of that trade lane to provide the extra capacity needed to go from Asia to Europe because of the longer way around. It's also because... Um, all of these trades depend on the same asset, which is containers. And if there's not enough containers, yes. uh, then you're going to have to pay more to, you know, for the ones that there are. And so you get a supply and demand dynamic that's driving up the cost of everything. Uh, we have a great visual tool here at Bloomberg to kind of track the movement of those containers through the ships. We talked about Tesla as the example at the top of this show, Ryan. But in simple terms, the parts and components they need to feed the assembly lines are not getting through. So they've halted production. 
Do you have any customer examples where something similar has happened or any specific industries that have a micro hit from what's happening in the Red Sea? Well, it's across the board, you know, and anything, anything that's manufacturing related where you're really depending on these inbound parts to then run an assembly line is going to be hit by that. And then the other thing, the other big thing you see is manufacturing that's done in ports that are no longer getting the same service level. So a really good example of this is we have a company that makes apparel in Jordan. And Jordan's port, of course, is on the Red Sea at Aqaba. And the carriers that would often stop there on the way through the Suez are not going through there at all. And it, Jordan has lost most of the ocean capacity that was serving. And so this customer, you know, we're scrambling on their behalf, starting to find alternate routes, whether that's air freight or some of it's going to get trucked over to Dubai and put on a ship there. So all kinds of this kind of thing happening at a very granular level, because, of course, every ship that gets rerouted has 10,000 containers and each of those has a journey of its own that needs to get replanned and, and find a new destination, a new, a new sailing. Ryan, of course, you're on the very cutting edge of how technology is the solve, the solution, the transparency to this. But I ask you a more macro picture question of ultimately, is inflation going to be driven up more longer term? You've, we've seen the supply chain snarl happen before. From your experience, mm. is this already going to be filtering in? Yeah, it, it all is just a question of how long this lasts. Um, but absolutely, we have to if it lasts for any any period of time, more than a quarter or two is what I would guess is that you know, I don't think companies want to just immediately change the price of the things they sell. They've, they kind of set these things on a longer term horizon. But if you believe that this is going to last for a few months or a few quarters, you only have two choices. You either pass the price through to your customer or you make less money. And I think people know, you know what most businesses will do if they have the pricing power. Uh, they're going to raise the prices to customers. And, 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 and it can be quite significant, as we saw during the 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 supply chain congestion of years past, it can, in that time, we, we estimated it was three or 4% of inflation for goods shipped by ocean containers, which is most consumer goods. Ryan, what is being stress tested in your technology right now? You came on a few weeks ago and it was really interesting about the fact that a lot of these ships, for example, having to turn off their satellites because they don't want to be well intercepted by the Houthi rebels when they are indeed still traversing through the Red Sea. Ultimately, what are you currently using? What new adoption of technology are you trying to build for these sorts of scenarios? Yeah, well, so we've had to go through and, you know, our, our, our technology tracks the ships by satellite. And like you said, it, a lot of these uh, carriers have turned off transponders as they get close to make it harder for uh, anybody who's trying to attack them to identify them. Um, you also get data from the carriers to, you know, sailing schedules and routes and plans and things like this. Well, the problem with all data is that it all it all comes from the same place, which is the past. And when the future looks different than the past, these things can rapidly not function the way they should. So it actually speaks to the approach that we've always taken at Flexport, which is later on humans who are working hard, you know, every day to solve these problems, track the ships manually. We call the carriers. We're in there, you know, in, in in there editing things manually where needed um, to keep the system up to date. But this system has performed very well. One technology change that we did make was very simple, but visualize it so that a customer can see which of their containers is being rescheduled, make it very obvious which ships are going to be, which containers are going to be delayed, and then give them action plans. Um, the other thing I think I'm really proud of is that our team went and updated our carbon calculator. Uh, you know, it takes a lot, it takes about 20% longer to go around Therefore, you emit 20% more carbon. So we've, we've had to go through and estimate, you know, change all the estimates for how much carbon gets emitted on these ships. So a um, lot, lot of hard work at Flexport. We're kind of working overtime week, nights and weekends right now to keep, keep our customers informed. But Ryan, in, in 2020, I was trying to work out what the story with Tesla was. And a Tesla executive messaged me and said, get in your car, drive from San Francisco to Oakland, and on your way on the Bay Bridge, look right out of your window and tell me what you see. And he was referring to all of the ships parked, waiting to unload. That was the issue, right, of, of the 2020-21 crisis. What is different this time? And, and I ask you to have a crystal ball. <laughs> How long will it take to unwind relative to the months and months of that previous saga? Yeah, well, they're, they're really quite different because the 2020-21 uh, crunch was really driven by an increase in demand. We shipped more containers than ever. There was a 20% increase in containers arriving in the United States because customers weren't able to spend money on travel, on restaurants, on services. They were shifting that consumption to goods. And so we had so much more demand that the ports couldn't keep up. 
And so you had then the ports became congested and you had that resulted in a decrease in capacity. So it was really a double whammy in 2020 and 2021. What you're looking at now is just a reduction in supply. There's no corresponding increase in demand. Um, so it's it's different in that regard. And it's less of a traffic jam than it is a detour. Um, and that detour runs at the same speed. It just takes longer. So I, I think the world will adapt better than it did in 2020 and 2021. Um, not to say it's not a big impact and certainly short term, it's a pretty big deal. Talking crystal ball, um, well, the ocean container shipping industry ordered a lot of ships. In the peak of all those high shipping prices of 2020 through 2022, the carriers made a lot of money and they reinvested in their fleets. And those ships are coming online this year and next year and even into the year after that. And so you have a lot of capacity coming online that will, although we have a decrease in capacity resulting from this rerouting, if you're taking long-term view or even medium-term view, you're going to see that made up for by new ships. So I don't, yeah, I don't, it can't predict how long this will last, but even if it lasts a long time, I think you'll see the, the ocean market kind of stabilize and get to a relatively normal pricing environment versus long-term historical averages. Of course, it'll be higher than it was going to be if this yeah. hadn't happened, um, but I think the, the world will recover. A demand and supply side issue, but both inflationary. Ryan Peterson, it's so great to catch up with you. Thank you for spending some time with us. Flexport CEO, a busy guy at the moment. Meanwhile, coming up, you know, we were talking about Tesla, the implications on its own supply. What about demand at the moment, particularly in China? They're trimming the prices of some of their models again. We'll have all the details next. This is Bloomberg Technology. Tesla cuts prices in China again. The company reduced starting prices of the Model 3 sedan by 5.9% to a little more than 34,000 US dollars and marked down the Model Y sport utility vehicle by 2.8%. That's to around 36,000 US dollars. That according to the Chinese version of Tesla's website. The car maker also says its lone European factory near Berlin will be disrupted by attacks in the Red Sea and there is a halt to production there. Let's bring in Bloomberg's global auto editor, Craig Trudell. And let's start with China. We gave the numbers, but the context is that this is one of several cuts to prices in China over the course of the last year. Yeah, I mean, this really started even, I would say, late in 2022 when we saw, you know, Tesla sort of open the first salvo of, of price cutting in China. And last year, it really was just relentless on the part of, of Tesla and the broader industry. But I think, you know, of the two, what, what most stands out to me of these uh, cuts, uh, the, the two models that Tesla has, uh, is the Model 3. I think there was some hope that, you know, with updating the, the sedan and, and kind of, you know, giving uh, you know, buyers a, a reason to uh, have a fresh look at that car. Uh, you know, th this is a, a fairly substantial price cut, only, you know, a few weeks uh, removed from when uh, Tesla, you know, updated the, the Model 3. And so this is, you know, potentially a, a cause for concern if you if you were kind of counting on this mm -hmm. idea that refreshing the lineup a little bit would lead to pricing, you know, essentially bottoming and, and uh, stabilizing here. And for that context, it feels that investors feel similarly. The stock is off by almost 4% on the day. In fact, it's had a pretty awful week of run of it because within this worry about China and the price competition, and we also add to the context BYD suddenly becoming, well, basically a challenger when it comes to numbers of EVs being sold. And well, more broadly, it feels as though Tesla is having to come up against growing concern about EV demand broadly. I think at Cox Automotive, for example. Yeah, I, I think the, the Hertz uh, story yesterday is something we can't forget here yeah. as well. I think, you know, when we, we think about Tesla, we think about China and the U.S. being really important to them in particular. Uh, in the U.S. Uh, for, you know, a, a big customer in Hertz to, you know, it, it, it's really an incredible story to me when we think back to when it was announced that Hertz was going to buy a lot of Teslas. That was what made Tesla a trillion dollar company. And, you know, wow, has that really sort of ended in tears for Hertz. Uh, for them to make this, you know, real sharp uh, U-turn from uh, a big investment in electrifying their fleet 
uh, that, that is not a, a particularly positive uh, development uh, for Tesla, uh, to say the least. And I think the fact that you're now seeing Hertz, uh, you know, launch a sort of fire sale mm. uh, of Teslas is not good for the resale values of, of Teslas and, and, you know, potentially could hurt, uh, you know, demand for, for new Teslas in the sense that, you know, there's a whole lot of supply of, of used Teslas now on the market for people to take a look at rather than, than look at new. Craig Jadel, we thank you so much, giving all of what was a pretty horrible, very bad week for Tesla. Ed? To a big interview for us, European antitrust regulators say the relationship between Microsoft and OpenAI is one they're monitoring closely. I sat down with European Commission Executive Vice President Margrethe Vestager for an exclusive interview about big tech and the competitive market. Listen. I think we all followed almost hour by hour uh, the situation of, uh, of the leadership of uh, OpenAI, uh, the back and forth, uh, how it was uh, first very opaque and then it became more and more clear. Uh, and what is interesting for us, of course, is what is the real relationship between OpenAI and Microsoft when it comes to, to control uh, of the business uh, in question. Uh, this is very preliminary, but it is part of a, a, a sort of a larger endeavor to understand how AI will uh, affect uh, our marketplaces. Because what we have seen with technology over the last two decades, it has completely upended how a number of markets are working, both the digital markets themselves, but also other markets. Now, when we put in AI to that game, uh, of course, we see that this may accelerate some of the uh, behaviors that we have seen and some of the things that we've been concerned about. So we've just launched a, a probe for market participants, uh, for businesses, uh, for lawyers, for, for academics to participate and to give us feedback as to how will AI uh, influence uh, competitive competitivity uh, in the market. And Commissioner, that extends all his hardware. NVIDIA disclosed that you were looking informally at its uh, behavior within the graphics card market. Mm. Uh, again, the, the similar question, but what were your concerns that prompted you to look? Well, our concerns are, it, it may sound very trivial, uh, but it is always the same thing that is driving us to make sure that the market is truly open and competitive. And, and when it comes to everything digital, we are in a situation where um, network effects, where scale really matters. Uh, that goes for both some of the hardware companies and goes indeed for, for software. So we are driven by uh, sort of what we have seen over the last uh, 10 years, that you really need to be on the point before markets tip if you want to make sure that smaller uh, businesses, competitors actually can, uh, can both I innovate but also scale in this environment. I want to go back to a period of time before you took a leave of absence mm -hmm. to pursue the EIB role, which we can discuss. One of the last things you did was order on a prelim basis that Google break up its ad tech business. That's been and done. You've kind mm -hmm. of followed the steps of the DOJ. Is that kind of a template or model of some action you could take in your remaining year in this role? Well, it all depends on the cases. Uh, because, Which cases? No, but we, in, in order to, to, uh, to ask or suggest something as far reaching as a breakup, uh, of course, that has to be the only solution. Let's talk about those 11 newly allowed Bitcoin exchange traded funds. Many investors are actually discovering that approved doesn't always mean available. Vanguard's brokerage arm, for example, will not offer trading in these ETFs that invest directly in spot Bitcoin, according to a spokesperson. Merrill Edge is still evaluating whether to provide the service or not. Still Mark founder and managing partner Elise Colleen is with us because she has been backing these startups, these Bitcoin-enabled businesses and founders since 2013. And we want to get your take, Elise, on what seems to be some good fun flow coming in. Perhaps some still difficulty getting access if you're a, perhaps a bro brokering with Vanguard. But what does this mean for your space? Well, it was a blockbuster day one for the Bitcoin spot ETF class. We saw about a projected 625 million in flows with Bitwise, BlackRock and Fidelity leading the class. 
What's important for my space in the private markets is that the financialization of Bitcoin is proceeding at a rapid pace. We see that now reflected in this mainstream finance, financial acceptance and adoption of Bitcoin through the Bitcoin spot ETF. But on the private side, innovation is happening as well that further advances Bitcoin as, um, as an asset and as a currency. What sort of solutions and indeed what problems are they trying to solve? Because ultimately, I'm, I'm wondering whether there's any cannibalization by the fact that now you don't need to go and open up wallets, go and invest in Bitcoin directly. You can gain exposure through an ETF. It's so much easier. Well, this is what's important about the introduction of the spot ETF is that it's an easy access product for retail investors and institutions that may feel more confident in first accessing Bitcoin through a regulated product like the ETF. Um, on top of that, the marketing that has gone into the launch of these products and that supports their continued adoption is consistent with Bitcoin's um, core principles, which is that Bitcoin allows investors to hedge against risk of inflation or monetary debasement that have been global concerns, including for developed markets like the US. What we expect to see from the spot ETF is that adoption of Bitcoin will increase because investors now have a familiar and easy way to access it. What I expect to see in the longer term or in the midterm even, is that accessing Bitcoin and holding Bitcoin through a spot ETF, holding exposure to Bitcoin, will allow people the motivation to continue to learn about Bitcoin and will could lead to people's direct yes. access and purchase of Bitcoin or related products. Uh, Elise, th there's familiar and easy way to access and then there's the 11 ETFs that got approved. And it's amazing that in the news cycle, we're already flagging those that won't actually offer the service. Do we need 11 ETFs? Market will decide that. I'm not sure that we need 11, but we do see some breakout performance, as I noted with Bitwise, Fidelity and BlackRock. On the private side, some of the products that are developing to further financialize the space are also exciting and likely to those that purchase the spot ETF themselves. So to mention a few of the areas of innovation that we're seeing in the private markets, I'll note that Bitcoin denominated insurance products came to market in late 2023. What that means is that you can hold a policy that's denominated in right. BTC and it's producing a BTC um, return. Right. And we're seeing products that also further help the space mature, such as uh, Elise, uh, proof of reserve software. Just deep um, analysis, Elise. And we're, we're grateful for your time, Elise, but we're out of time. This is Bloomberg Technology. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. Cara, a quick check in on the markets. In the NASDAQ 100 context, we're actually in the red right now, modestly off by a tenth of 1%. But on a five-day basis, this is exciting. We are having and on track to have our first positive week of 2024. OK, it's only the second week of 2024, but it's Friday and let's end things on a positive note nonetheless. It's interesting because economic data has been a big factor this week. We've kind of swung between boosting and then cutting and then boosting again, again our expectations for the level of Fed rate cuts in 2024. And that impacts the technology sector because, as we know, higher rates discount the present value of future cash flows. Everyone is watching, whether you are public or private markets, and we'll have that private markets conversation later. On a points mover perspective to the upside in particular, there is some momentum right now around Meta. I don't see any real news catalyst when it comes to social media stocks or Meta in particular, but it is up a percentage point. It is doing well. The opposite of that being Tesla was the biggest points drag on the NASDAQ 100. But it's interesting to see some buoyancy, particularly in mega cap tech, on a day that Bloomberg News wrote in 2024, the Magnificent Seven may not be as magnificent as they were last year. Yeah, Meta had had some analyst upgrades throughout the week and, and some bullishness across the board. But social media is one that we just want to focus in on a little bit more because there have been plenty of announcements, even from the privately held ones like X. This week it's in fact saying that it's going to launch new shows with Don Lemon, with Tulsi Gabbard, with Jim Rome. 
as the platform looks to add legitimacy, basically, to its renewed push into video, which has been a key focus for the owner, Elon Musk, of course. Numbers Kurt Wagner joins us now with the details. And it was really interesting to see who they were backing, how they were backing, and particularly when perhaps they've lost one of the key focuses that they did have, of course, a guy coming from Fox who's decided to go off instead of his own particular outlet. Right. Yeah. I mean, it feels like they're sort of this home for a lot of people who, you know, had major platforms and now are sort of maybe looking for a new place to go. Right. Don Lemon, obviously, being a, a prime example there. Tucker Carlson, you mentioned. Um, but, you know, I couldn't help but essentially when I heard this news, they announced it this week, timed it with CES. And I couldn't help when I heard it. But think back to the old regime of Twitter back in 2016, 2017. You, you may remember, Caroline, they you know, signed a deal with the NFL. They mm. signed deals with a lot of different publishers to stream live video. It was all about live. And this feels very similar. I'm not sure if these are going to be live. It sounds like these are going to be more like packaged shows. But at the same time, this push into premium video content, you know, might provide them with a new uh, or at least a revamped revenue stream here. But it's interesting to see the strategy sort of being recycled now a few years later. Kurt, you know, there's video and then there's video. And you and I were discussing behind the scenes earlier this right. week, like, does, does X become a sort of dedicated vertical video play and then you're taking on the likes of Reels and TikTok or does it become a content platform a la you're watching shows which are not necessarily in the vertical form? And, and my read on it is that X hasn't quite decided really what it wants to be in the video context. Yeah, I think you're right. And, and I think these are they sound similar in that they're obviously both video strategies, but they're they're quite different. Right. I think if you go down the X or excuse me, in the, the TikTok reels route, you're really going to be courting kind of uh, regular creators. Right. People with lower budgets, people who are are just simply trying to, uh, you know, maybe get a small revenue share. When you start going after the larger, maybe more traditional types of, of video that you would see on television, you know, those are much bigger budgets. Those are bigger commitments. Um, you know, you might be able to sell larger ad packages against a specific show, right? And so, you know, we've heard Elon talk about his uh, admiration for YouTube and how he wants X to be more like YouTube. Um, you know, it's a lofty goal, of course, but I think it'll really be interesting to see which of these two paths they, they push down uh, more. Right now, it feels like they're kind of doing a little bit of both. Bloomberg's Kurt Wagner, and, you know, important to note that X and Linda Yaccarino did everything to have a super big presence at CES this year, which was interesting. A lot of that news coming from there. Big thanks to Kurt. OK, sticking with social media, this year marks the 20th anniversary of Facebook. And priorities have changed for the social platform's parent company, Meta. Founder Mark Zuckerberg has become deeply engaged in his efforts in AI, with Metaverse dreams seemingly deferred. Bloomberg's Asia Counts wrote the story, fantastic deep dive and long form piece in Business Week and joins us now. I mean, that is the story, social platform to the metaverse, and now it's all about AI. Exactly it, right? It, it's funny to think back 20 years ago when Mark Zuckerberg started Facebook out of his Harvard dorm room, and it was all about just connecting with friends and family, and so much has changed since then, right? It's gone through sort of crypto and going after video. There was like the Cambridge Analytica scandal. There's so many things that happened. And then in 2021, he changes the name to Meta, short for the metaverse. And he goes all in and spends $50 billion on this idea that we're going to live in this virtual world. Obviously, that didn't really work. People didn't buy the VR headsets. And then ChatGPT came out. And it was all out AI craze in the tech industry. And now Meta is trying to, to position and set up to actually be a leading player in AI. So really big shifts in, in the company. What I love about your story are the anecdotes, the behind the scenes. And you take us back to the Allen Co meeting several years I think, ago, 2021, between mm -hmm. Sundar Pichai saying, congratulating Mark Zuckerberg on the feats they'd made in AI. And, and Zuck wasn't that aware of them, of course, himself totally embroiled in the metaverse at that time. Yeah, exactly, exactly, right? He was so focused on the metaverse that he wasn't keeping an, an eye on what was going on in his AI research lab. And the AI research lab had been around for almost a decade at that point that he had that conversation with Sundar. And so it really was kind of like an aha moment, a wake up moment. And he went back to his AI research team and it was like employees were saying that they were scrambling to get summaries of work to send to Zuck and they were sending emails. And, and so it was this, this rush to make sure that he was really up to speed. And to his credit, he did get up to speed quickly. Um, but again, it was still sort of this focus on the metaverse. It wasn't really till ChatGPT came out that there really was this sort of big push within the company of like, okay, how do we put AI into our products in a new way? 
and now you have 100 million people, I think, using llama already, Asia counts. We didn't even get to discuss macadamia nut eating cows on a ranch in Hawaii. Here. Shame, we'll do it next time. Uh, Meanwhile, coming up, look, the big move is official in VC. Keith Raboy returning to Kosler Ventures. Why? We're gonna join by Vinod Kosler. Keith Raboy next, this is Bloomberg Technology. Okay, time for Talking Tech. First up, longtime Apple board directors Al Gore and James Bell will be retiring from the company. Gore was the longest serving member, having joined in 2003 when co-founder Steve Jobs was the CEO and the iPhone didn't even exist yet. And Tata Consultancy and Infosys, India's two biggest IT firms, told investors a long-awaited recovery in global tech spending may finally get underway in 2024. Shares climbed following the news. Plus, shares of Kura Sushi USA, which uses robot servers and offers toy prizes at its restaurants, are undergoing a rocky stretch, suggesting that investors are starting to wonder whether it can live up to the excitement. Kura Sushi placed a big bet on expansion during the pandemic and even soared to a billion dollar market value back in July. Karen. A fun way to eat. Meanwhile, coming up, big move. It's official in VC. We're going to be having that conversation. Keith Raboy joins us next and why he's returning to Coastal Ventures. Vino Coastal also with us. Stick with it. This is Bloomberg Technology. All right, deal done. Keith Raboy has returned to Coastal Ventures as a managing director, departing Peter Thiel's Founders Fund, where he had served as a general partner since 2019. Let's bring in Coastal Ventures co-founder Vinod Coastler for more on the news, along with Keith Raboy himself, who joins us in Miami. Vinod, I start with you. And you, you've had a back and forth already with each other on X. But who phoned who? Whose idea was this? Well... We've always gotten along and stayed in very close touch. So when Keith was thinking of something new, we got together. And um, I think um, Keith and uh, Samir talked. And Keith and I then followed up with a dinner. And that was it. It was pretty simple. So, Keith, it, it sounds like this was an initiative or an idea that, that came to you first. You know, you... We're at Kosla and you've been at Founders Fund and you're back at Kosla. Why did you think of this? What, what's driving you in this decision? Well, I spent six years at Kosla between 2013 and 2019, and we had an incredible run and track record there in KV4, KV5, and KV6, where I think every single MD produced multiple IPOs during that era. So, sort of, um, obviously, we had a you know, significant traction together and sort of missed that. Secondarily, I learned a lot about deep technology investing, which I knew nothing about when I joined, um, about liquid biopsies to detect cancer, about the fundamental premise of AI and the potential of AI, about robotics, about actually low cost rockets into space. And I kind of missed the education part of my job. Um, I know a lot about a lot of things in technology and company building, but I was getting a free education every day at every partner meeting. And so that was really exciting. I was considering new alternatives and it just made so much sense to go back. Um, we've been working together for the last five years. In some ways, it feels like I never left. Um, I work very closely with Vinod's partners and MDs, uh, Samir, as Vinod mentioned, and David Wyden. Um, I probably see them at a board meeting once a week. Uh, so the interaction and the dialogue never changed. The overlap in our portfolios between Founders Fund and KV is ex substantial, going way back to 2013 and 14 with Affirm and Stripe, now OpenAI, but up and coming companies like the company I'm CEO, OpenStore, Delian's company, Varda. We've been working together on Eight Sleep and changing the world by allowing people to sleep better. So the natural overlap just made this so logical. Yeah. Keith, I can see the pull. What was the push? Why did you start to think you wanted something different? Well, you always wonder, like, how do you be happier? How do you be more successful? Um, you know, like, 
I try to do it once a year in ten of like every day so I can sleep better. <laughs> but uh, you always you, you you do realize like what there are people in environments that you thrive in, and there's environments that are better for other people. What I do really well is invest very early, mentoring and serve as a consigliere to founders, and have high impact in ambitious founders' visions and achieving those ambitions. And that's a great fit with how Vinod has built uh, Coastal Ventures from the very, very beginning. And so that was so ideal for what I like to do and how I like to compete in the world. Vinod, where then to put Keith's expertise? You do have these overlapping investments. Is it that he's going to be on the ground with founders? Is it building out Miami? I think the goal is very simple. Uh, we are in, not in the investing business. We are in what we call the venture assistance business, assisting entrepreneurs build large companies. That's the part of Keith's skill set that is extremely valuable. Uh, one thing to realize about the partners, the MDs at Coastal Ventures is everyone is very, very different. We don't, we're not similar skill sets. So we have real diversity in skill sets. And Keith just adds to it, and the more diversity you have in your skill sets, the better decisions you make and better company building. Most people in the investing business really don't know company building, and Keith does, and so I, that's why I think he's such an important addition to our team. Uh, Keith, the word that Vinod used for you uh, a lot was mentor. And it's interesting, you, you were just talking about your learning in deep tech, your background in fintech. And, and I'm just really interested mechanically, there must be some portfolio companies at Coastler that, were, that are there, that were there when you were with the firm first time around, and there are new ones. So you have an opportunity to get involved with new companies. And I wondered if you had a wish list uh, without making it awkward with Vinod virtually <laughs> sat beside you. And, and actually, specifically, does OpenAI make that list? Because you could do some work there, given recent events. Um, obviously, I'd like to find new ambitious founders who want to change the world and have impact in their lives and have impact in society. That's the primary goal. Um, there are a few companies, actually, this may surprise you, that, that I invested in more than five years ago that I'm still on the board of. A fair being one, a firm being another. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of continuity there. And then there's some founders who I invested back in my day, uh, 2013 to 2019, that want me back. So we can always consider that. But really, you know, we want to look forward to what is the future of technology? How do you change society? How do you make society better? And who are the iconic founders who have potential to do that, which is very rare. And I, gotta, I have to go find them before other people do. Vinod, you've got a lot of money to put to work. Kozler also has been deeply active, I think the most active deployer of venture capital in fourth quarter. Is that going to be the way you look at the first as well? You know, we don't look at the rate at which we are investing. We look at the rate at which we are getting great entrepreneurs to work with us. Uh, so we don't have a pace or a strategy around rates. Our focus is very much on when do we run into a great entrepreneur, how do we convince them to work with us, and how can we help them build a company. So I, we don't keep track of industry metrics or where we stand in terms of rate of investing. Uh, it's very much focused on when we see the right opportunities. What's surprising is through 2021 20, and 22. Our rate of investing didn't change very much, though the industry went through real up cycles and down cycles. But if, you, if we look internally at the number of major investments we make per month or per year, our rate has stayed relatively constant. We didn't increase dramatically from 2018 to 2021, and we didn't decrease significantly from 2021 to mm. 2023. Cycle agnostic. I'm interested, Keith, in cultural differences. You've spoken about how, when you were at Kosla, the Monday meeting, the all-important gathering of the partners, the sharing of information, the stress testing of ideas, and then at Founders Fund, how everyone sort of had their own mini business models. They're sort of a portfolio manager as such. But is there more autonomy for you at Kosla vis-a-vis Founders Fund or not? 
Well, I always had autonomy at Kosla, but we had very spirited, vigorous debates about the quality of thinking behind any investment, whether it was something I was championing or something Vinod was championing. And I, do, I did miss that. I think it made me sharper, even though it was ultimately my decision on whether to invest and on what terms to invest. But just listening to Vinod or listening to David speaking in the back of my brain or Samir um, actually did make me a better investor. And sometimes not because they were critical, sometimes because they led me to double down on things that I liked but they were encouraged me to be even more aggressive. And so it, it was just very, very, very helpful to me as a person. Uh, Vinod, you know, uh, yourself might, uh, and Keith uh, uh, now. Oh, sorry, please continue. Yeah, I just want to add to it. Our strategy is very much bold bets, early bets, and impactful bets, societally impactful bets. What that means in practice is we have to invest in outliers, not what everybody else is investing in. And because of that, we have an unusual investment process. I don't get to approve investments. Any of the MDs can decide to make any decision, but they have to listen to all the other MDs' opinions first. So very much operate like a group, but we want yes. an MD to believe in what they're doing and they independently decide to invest or not. I don't get to make that call for others. They don't get to make that call for me. And then right. the other half of the administration of the firm is very, very unanimous. So we are quite different in how we make decisions from most other venture firms. Uh, Vino, those MDs, including Keith, are going to have a, a, a lot more cash to play with. You just closed... $3.1 billion in three new funds, I believe, from sort of seed through to, to growth stage. Um, how are you going to assess Keith's performance? <laughs> this is an awkward live television scorecard set up for the year. You know, it's very simple. So one thing that's very unusual for Kosla is we don't have companies or investments assigned to people, we don't measure individually. So we have no measurement system. How much profit did you make? Which investment did you bring in? Because everything's a team effort. We even transfer opportunities. Uh, you know, one person may be on the board of a company and when they reach a different stage, we'll assign somebody else. So we don't measure. I personally mostly look at both at the MD level, but more importantly, at the next level, what kinds of questions uh, do investment partners ask? How insi insightful are those questions? So evaluation is much more about the questions than the answers or the opportunities. Uh, I, also, I also remember when I first joined uh, COSLA, 2013, there was a job spec for MDs. And one of the first bullet points was, you're the first person the founder calls. And I think that's an ingredient in success, which is if you're so helpful, so insightful, so reliable, and so trustful that the founder, when they have problems or challenges or opportunities, they call you before anybody else on the planet, you're going to do, you're going to do pretty well in venture. Right. Uh, Keith, we have 30 seconds, but it's an election year. Peter Thiel is a political beast. You know, how did that factor in? And, and do you and Vinod pay attention to the election this year? I won't speak for Vinod, but obviously I pay attention as an amateur to politics. Vinod, are you paying attention? I do pay attention, but I'm, more, I'm registered independent. Mm. I used to be a Republican till the climate issues became predominant and then became an independent. Yeah. Um, I do think that there's a 50% probability the face-off won't be between Biden and Trump. And lastly, we got 10, 20 seconds. More Miami, do we think, Keith? Well, I love Miami, but I'll be in the Bay Area. I have a lot of portfolio companies that were found in the Bay Area. I'd like to attend partner meetings uh, as much as possible because I think they are really useful in understanding the portfolio and the vigor of the debate and the incisive questions is better in person than on Zoom. But I'm going to stay in Miami. Well, we thank you both for joining on Zoom today. It's great to have some time with the Coastal Ventures co-founder, Vinod Kosler, Managing Director, Keith Raboy, both now of Coastal Ventures. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology, Ed. Yeah, that conversation, listen to it again on the podcast, wherever you get your podcasts, Apple and the Bloomberg platforms, Spotify. This is Bloomberg Technology.